you know, back to uh, 8701. Um, so in this section, we'll talk about uh, relativistic kinematics. Um, but let me start by saying that one of my favorite classes here at MIT is a class called H20, Special Relativity, where um, we teach students about uh, special relativity, of course, but Einstein and uh, paradoxes. And it's one of my favorite classes. And in that class, um, there's a component on particle physics, which has to do with just using relativistic kinematics in order to understand how to create antimatter, how to um, you know, collide beams, how we can analyze decays. And in this introductory section, we want to do a very similar thing. Um, I trust that you all um, had some sort of class introduction of special relativity, some of you maybe general relativity. Um, what we want to do here is review this content very briefly, uh, but then more use it in, in a number of examples. So in particle physics, nuclear physics, we often deal with particles which travel close to the speed of light. The photon travels at the speed of light. Um, we typically <clears throat> define the velocity as V over C. A natural unit, beta, beta is the velocity. Gamma is defined by one over square root one minus the velocity squared. Um, beta is always smaller or equal to one, smaller for mass, mass of particle and gamma is always equal or greater than one. The total energy of a particle with zero mass, non, sorry, with non-zero mass, is then given by gamma times mc squared. Um, and the momentum is given by gamma times mv or gamma times m beta. The total energy squared of a particle, and we are considering one mass of particle, or one particle, is given by energy squared equal momentum squared plus mass squared. Um, if you now consider a particle with zero mass, you see that the energy and the momentum are equal. If you consider a particle at rest, meaning the momentum is zero, you see that the energy is equal to the mass. So you get Einstein's famous formula, the energy is equal, E equal mc squared, the energy is equal to the mass. So there's an equivalence between those two. Um, what we want to fully under, understand and control our Lorentz transformations are here shown uh, for the example that we have a boost or a transformation in x direction. So you see that energy and momentum transform like time and space. Um, and you just, I really encourage you to just review this um, in more general cases, but you can always, when you have a, a boost in one direction, just do a rotation and get to this more simplified case. So here's the first example I'd like you to actually go through. Um, the Lorentz transformation here, I decided to use the z direction uh, just to change things up a little bit. And the velocity of the boosted frame is vb. So we want to uh, calculate um, the quantity m square c square m in the transform frame. And what you will find if you actually do the calculation and the solutions are in the uh, backup slides is that that quantity um, doesn't change on the Lorentz transformation. It is invariant. And we'll talk about an invariant mass in this context. So now in particle physics, we often have the case that we are not considering, considering just one particle and want to describe this one particle or measure it, um, but often the case of particles or multiple particles which are involved in a reaction. So we can look at the total energy, just the sum of the energy of all particles, the total momentum, the sum of the momentum of all particles. And those two quantities are always conserved. They are not invariant. So be aware of the distinction between conserved properties and invariant properties. Invariant here means, you know, we perform a transformation like the Lorentz transformation and the property doesn't change. Conserved here means we have a reaction and in that reaction, the property is not changing. Those are two different distinct things. So now you can do, you look at the invariant property or the one which is conserved um, in, in this collision, which is uh, this, this mass term or mass square term, the total mass. We just define this total mass as equal to the energy square minus the momentum square. Um, and then we can consider the two cases of a laboratory frame and the so-called center of mass frame. 
So in the laboratory frame, we have a particle, it's moving. Now we observe this particle and then it decays into, in this example, three daughter particles. In the center of mass frame, in this example, we put ourselves into the rest frame of the particle we are interested in. And in that frame then, three particles emerge um, and we can describe the three particles. So momenta between the three daughter particles are not going to be this way. But because um, this total mass is an invariant property, it's the same in both frames. And it's equal to the mass of the parent particle which we decayed. So when you measure the energy and momentum of the daughter particles, you can infer in any frame um, the mass of the parent particle by calculating the total mass. And so you can infer from those measurements the identity of the mother particle. And that's, for example, how we discover the Higgs boson. We measure the Higgs boson decay into a pair of photons, and then we calculate the mass of those two photons in our laboratory frame, and that mass then is equal to the Higgs mass. So now here we want to compare or look into those two cases a little bit more. The first case is a case where we have a particle one colliding with a particle two, where the particle two is at rest. Particle one has a certain energy, E1. And the second example, this is called a fixed target experiment. So the second particle is fixed, the first one is colliding. The second example is the one where we have two particles and both have energies and we bring them to collision. Often the two particles are of same nature, like two protons, one electron and positron, and the energies of the beams are the same. But this doesn't have to be the case. Later in the class, we'll look at heavy ion collisions, so the collision of heavy ions like lead with a proton. And here the masses are different and the energy of the particles can be different. All right, and here's another exercise now. So we wanna actually create a Z boson, which has a mass of about 91 GeV. Note, I dropped the C square, one over C square here. And you wanna produce this party by colliding a positron with an electron. So this has happened at lab at CERN um, in the late 80s and 90s. Um, the center of mass energy, often also called um, square root S, is equal to 91 GeV. So that's the energy we need in order to produce this new particle. The mass of the electron and the positron are 511 keV or 0.511 MeV. So the energy needed is 45 GeV, 45.5 GeV. However, that was the you know, setup at lab where you have two beams colliding. So we have this you know, center of mass energy being given by the energy, directly given approximately by the energy of the two beams. So now imagine somebody would have proposed a fixed target experiment where you have stationary electrons, for example, electrons in atoms, you know, just a gas of some sorts, and then you have produced positrons in a beam, uh, accelerate them and bring them to collision. So the question here now is, how large does the, do you need an energy of this positron beam? How large does it have to be in order to produce a Z boson? So again, this is something I would like you to actually explore and just write down. Solutions for this example are also in the backup. So now, you know, there is an, a number of interesting examples just coming from E equal mc square and from being able to use, and they can be answered by being able to use Lorentz transformation. And so now here I give you just a set of examples and um, you know, you should work on them on your own time. Maybe we'll touch on them in recitation. The first one is rather straightforward. Um, again, we're talking about lab at CERN. Um, you know, after the Z bosons were produced, one was trying to go to high energy to find some new physics, some new particle. Uh, for example, the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson might be produced by um, a process which is called higgs strahlung's process. We will look at this later. So you have an electron and a positron colliding to a virtual Z boson. So that is a Z boson which is heavier than 91 GeV. We'll see later how that's possible. But then that virtual Z boson can radiate a Higgs boson. So that's why it's called higgs strahlung like the German word for radiation, Strahlung process. And so 
electrons and positrons were accelerated to 100 GeV each, center of mass energy 200 GeV. What was the gamma factor for those electrons? Um, another question, which is quite exciting, is how much energy do you need in order to split a proton and a neutron, which is a bound state, it's called a deuteron. Um, and it's a fundamentally important uh, particle in the evolution of our universe, in the sense that in order to generate um, higher mass or higher proton number elements, a deuteron is rather important in this. And so just by knowing the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron, and the mass of the deuteron, you can now calculate um, how much energy is in the binded, or the, what is the binding energy between those particles. We'll talk a lot about models to calculate binding energy when we talk about nu uh, nuclear physics. But here, just from the kinematics, you can, and from E equal mc square, you can calculate how much energy needs to be in this binded or compound state. Um, from atomic physics, you might remember or know that uh, particles can, excited particles can emit photons. And so now you have a particle. You know, it goes, it de excites, it radiates a photon. What happens now to the photon? Imagine this is happening in a big gas or in some uh, solid state. Can the photon be reabsorbed by the same medium or even by the same, by the same particle? It's not a trivial question, um, but what is the condition under which, so for example, imagine you have a gas, there's an excited particle in it, it emits a photon, and so now the photon sees the rest of the gas. Can that rest of the gas absorb the photon? Interesting question. It's not trivial. Um, another interesting question, I think, is, you know, you're trying to produce new forms of matter. Um, like you just produced the Z boson, but you can also produce antiprotons. So what is the minimal energy in a proton on a fixed target experiment? So again, you have a target of protons um, in some form. You shoot a proton against this target and you try to produce an antiproton. So that means that you have to produce in this collision, you have two protons in the initial state, you have to have a proton, a proton, another proton, and an antiproton in your final state. Um, but what, how much energy is needed for the proton beam in order to succeed with this collision? My counting is incorrect here, so this should be five, but okay, fine. Um, decays. So I assume a pion decays at rest. So a pion is at rest. We looked at a pion, that's a compound state, a meson, out of an up quark and a down quark, and it might decay into an electron and a positron. Whatever, you know, the dynamics is in this decays, um, if you just look at the kinematics of this, how fast are the decay products? In order to calculate that, you need to look up the pion mass, the electron mass we just discussed, and the positron has the same mass. So how fast are electron and positron coming out of a pion decay? Assume that the pion is at rest, um, then you can uh, use momentum conservation and calculate the speed of the, of the electrons and positrons. Um, again, one of those minimal energy proton colliding experiments, very similar setup, but here we try to produce a proton, a neutron, and a pion out of proton-proton collision. And then the last one is the so-called Compton effect where you have a photon which scatters off an electron target. And so you have an incoming photon, an electron is at rest, and then you look at the scattered photon angle, the scattered electron angle, and in that collision, the energy of the photon is going to change. So the energy of the photon is h times nu, or h over lambda, the wavelength. And so the question is, how does the wavelength of the photon change in this kind of collision? So those are just examples in how you can use relativistic kinematics in order to uh, calculate very important aspects of collisions in particle physics without any understanding at this point of um, the underlying dynamics, the underlying forces, the underlying you know, um, conservation laws, uh, and so on. So in later in this class, we discuss uh, what is the likelihood of a uh, pion to decay into an electron positron, and why that is actually not that likely. Um, and also, you know, the collision rates, lifetimes of particles. But here we are just looking at the kinematic of those processes and calculate you know, how much energy is involved and um, 
or the momentum of resulting particles. So I'll stop here. Um, if you scroll down on the slides, you find solutions to two of the problems and we'll discuss them in recitation.